Hey, Rebel Bankers, this is your host, Chris Noggle, and welcome back to the show. So today, I'm doing a little something different. I'm here with Brett Stein, and the thing about that's so unique about this is he is from my neighboring country of Canada, not just Canada, but the greater GTA, the Toronto area. Now, if you don't know anything about Toronto, you will be blown away because we're going to talk about some things that might just knock you off your chair in terms of what's going on right up north, right from me. I mean, for me, they're just our neighbors, but for other parts of the country, you might not know what's happening in this little place called Toronto because it's it, it's just out of control is what it is. But before we get into to Brett and Brett's story, let's talk about you guys. Let's talk about your journey to becoming a rebel banker. And your journey starts somewhere. But the most important thing for your journey to being a rebel banker is you taking action. You have to start somewhere. I don't care if it's you grabbing a copy of my book, The Private Money Guide, or mapping out The Millionaire Mystery. You got to take action. Reading a book, getting knowledge, going on YouTube and everything else to learn will never get you ahead. It will give you knowledge, but knowledge is useless without application. So this show is all about people that take action. People that took that leap, people that went where nowhere else, no one else wanted to go because it was too hard, too much work, and there was too much risk and everybody was scared not these people. That is who we talk to on the show and that is who I want you to be. So let's just jump right into this. Brett, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Just a little bit nervous. Hands are a little clammy. First time I've ever done this, so uh, I'm excited. There you go. Just just like I was saying, you got to take action, get out of your comfort zone and do things for the first time, just like Brett here. First podcast. And I was inclined to do this podcast because first off, Brett's 25 years old. For, you, for those of you that are maybe listening to this and not watching the video, he's a 25-year-old who is from Toronto and doing big things in Toronto. And Toronto is like New York City in here in the States. It's a very tough place to carve a niche. It's a very tough place to go out there and get success like he has. So we're going to hear a lot about Brett's story and everything else. And, and with that story, actually, one of the things I want you to – actually, you know what, Brett, tell them – I want to get into your story in just a second, but I just need you to paint a picture of like, what the heck is going on up there in Toronto? Like, cause it's just not normal. So give everybody in the country that's listening to this podcast, a little insight on like what your properties up there are selling per square foot, what's going on in, in like just the insanity, just paint a picture for yeah. me. Cause no, not many people I, don't know. I, yeah. I mean, it, picture a roller coaster that's going up the hill and it's just, keeps going and keeps going and keeps going and you're waiting for the drop and it's never coming. Um, I mean, there are condos in the city of Toronto that are selling, that are selling for $1,700 a square foot uh, pre-construction. There, there used to be a day where pre-construction condos used to go for less than resale. Now it's even surpassing resale. Aren't they selling, uh, I, mean, I don't mean to cut you off, but aren't they like starting no, no. projects, somebody buys the condo and then before the condo is even done, they sell it for like a 30% profit? Yeah. That, so that's okay. called an assignment sale. Yeah. Just, I just, I just did one of those. Um, and the person that my client bought it from bought this condo for 250,000 and a year and a half later unloaded it for 410 just by trading a piece of paper, right? No brick and mortar. Uh, the place hasn't even registered and closed yet, and that person's already made their profit. It's unbelievable. That's nuts. Yeah, keep keep going with like what what else yeah. is going on over. Like talk about like those areas where no one used to want to live back back not that long ago. I mean, you're 25 and I'm 42, and I know Toronto well. I've been there so many times I can't even count. And Toronto, what it was back when I was out there surfing in the early 2000s and 1990s, and what it is today. Dude, it's not even the same thing. So, like, yeah. tell them a little bit yeah. about just growing up there. What what's transformed? For sure. Well, I mean, the epicenter of Toronto used to be a lot smaller than it is today, and with the population growth in the city, it just keeps expanding and expanding and expanding. Um, you know, for example, there used to be areas in Toronto that used to be meant for slaughterhouses that used to smell over there. Uh, you couldn't pick up a property anywhere for you know over maybe a hundred grand. This is maybe 25 years ago. And now you can't find something for under a million bucks. Uh, it, it doesn't matter where you are because the core centers of the city are getting so expensive to live in that their kids have to move out and go to a different area. 
And then the next generation can't live in that area. So they've got to move further. And it's just going north, south, east, west. And I mean, you can't find a house in the city of Toronto for under 800K. It's, it's insane. And then the rents, you know, the rents are going the same way. You can rent out a basement apartment for 1600 bucks a month. You know, wow. to live underground with one bedroom in 600 square feet in the basement of a house for 1600 a month. I mean, how it's are insane. people affording to live there? I mean, is there that many opportunities and that many jobs where it's supporting that kind of growth? I know one of the big things that I, I heard, and I, I could be wrong, is China used to buy up a ton of Toronto. And now the government, your government, put some stops to that and put some limits on how they could buy and what they could do. Like, what, what's going on there? Yeah, so I mean, the government put a 15% tax on foreign investors. And it didn't really stop a thing. So around three years ago, the, I mean, I don't want to say exactly it's coming from China, but somewhere in that area, a lot of investors coming over, buying big houses over here, mostly in Richmond Hill, Richmond Hill, Markham, and they were overpaying, sending their kids over here with 2 million bucks saying, go buy a house. And there were, you know, you could have a girlfriend and a boyfriend living in a 6,000 square foot house that they paid $2.1 million for right? Those two people don't need that space. They just, they don't know what the money transfers over here, right? Because in China, I think, you know, you're so used to living in such smaller spaces that are so much more expensive and it's so congested over here. Um, So what ends up happening is the Chinese buyers moved away from Richmond Hill. So now those houses that were going for $2 million now decreased in value by like 500 Gs. Right. So a house that could have sold three years ago in Richmond Hill for 2.1 million now can only get a price tag of one and a half. And it's it's really messed up the buyers uh, and the sellers, um, you know, their mindsets because they're thinking, well, three years ago, if I could get 2.1, I'm not selling for 1.5 now and they won't get it and they won't ever get it up there. So the Chinese buyers moved away from Richmond Hill and uh, Thornhill and Markham, and they moved into the downtown market. Now, when a condo comes up for sale, saying, you know, we're going to break grand, ground in two years and the condo is going to be finished in four, they're purchasing up 50% of the condo. Speculators, right? The, one, the, the units that are 400, 500, 600 square feet, bachelor apartments, uh, one bedrooms, and, uh, you know, and then they rent them out. Or they flip them, like you're saying, on assignments. So most of this buying that is driving up the prices is still coming from overseas and is still coming not from end users, but from investors who are buying two, three, four properties at one time. So, I mean, it's really hard here in Toronto, as great as it sounds for a real estate agent, as great as it sounds for a seller, it's hard for a buyer. It's hard for a first time home buyer. You're trying to look for a house and you're not only dealing with competition for end users, you're dealing with competition from overseas, competition from investors. And, you know, they end up jacking up the prices and they don't care about the appraisals on these places, going to the bank, getting a mortgage because they're buying in cash, right? And the end users over here, poor Brett, looking for his first home, can't get a mortgage from the bank because he has to overpay. He has to overpay on value here in order to get one. So better off renting, save the stress. Yeah, seriously. And, you know, there's a lot to be said about renting, but at what point do you think this is happening? Like, at what point does this whole thing come crashing down? I mean, it's just, it just seems like it can't continue at this crazy level. I, I'm, I can't think, I don't know how long this has been happening, but I mean, I know for a fact at least five plus years, this crazy, crazy growth is happening. And I mean, I hear these stories all the time of somebody bought a condo and then they basically sold the condo. Like you said, they did the assignment. Uh, I have lots of investors that lend money here in the States and that's how they made all their money doing exactly that. They brought their money over the border there and now they're just buying up Buffalo and, and lending money here in Buffalo. I mean, that is what keeps me up at night, right? The big crash. And that's what everybody asks about. It's, it's probably the First or second question when you talk to a realtor, the first question is, how's the market? And when's this going to end, right? And, you know, there's no real answer for it. But I look at markets like New York that 
are continuing to rise and hasn't seen a crash, at least not yet. Um, and if we continue to build upon our infra infrastructure, keep putting in the subway systems that we're, we're doing right now, that's congesting the city at the moment, but hopefully we'll free it up in the next three, four years. Uh, but the main thing is population growth. And as long as people keep coming to Toronto, that epicenter will continue to spread wider and wider and wider. And the prices in the core will continue to go up and they'll continue to affect all the other areas surrounding, right? So you'll get the Etobicos, the Oakville's, the Burlington's, the Hamilton's, all the way up to Barrie, you know, on Lake Simcoe, where no one would commute an hour back into Toronto to go live in Barrie five, 10 years ago. But now people are doing it because it's less expensive over there. And uh, you hop in your car down the highway and, and you're fine. It's the same thing going east and the, and the same thing going west. So, I mean, as it's long as people it's keep crazy. coming here, we, we should be okay to keep growing without that crash. I mean, you guys literally have private corporations and private individuals building roads. The, the, is that the 403? Is that what that is? The, four, the, four the ETR? Yeah. 407. The yeah, ETR wanna, 407. If you want to rip right across Toronto? I, that's how I always do it. 407? And then oh, I get yeah. a nice bill from whoever, you know, owns oh, those yeah. roads. Think about that, folks. This is not a road that the government or the state or, you know, the municipality put in. This is a private road and it's beautiful. Oh my God. It's literally like get on that sucker and just push the pedal as fast as you want to go. You just take her. And then all of a sudden you, you, when that thrill ends, you get a big bill in the mail for driving on the road. People yeah. will use that road yeah. because driving the QEW, you know, if they live out in those areas into the city, that could be what normally we used to be like, what, an hour commute, maybe a two hour commute. It can be four hours now. I mean, it's insanity. Yeah. I've been caught in that. And I just, yeah. honestly, I want to get out, light my car on fire and be like, I'm done with this. Then they came up with yeah. the toll roads. I've but, done that. I, yeah. I've done that. It was, I don't recommend it. You know, I had to get a new car, but it, it's, it's, I, I completely agree with you. If you if you leave any time from two thirty till seven o'clock, you're screwed. It's over. You're done. It, you're game done. over. Hon horns are honking. People are jumping out of their cars. You could run home faster. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's crazy. Well, that's why a lot of people. I'm not. I'm not a master on infrastructure, but a lot of people complain about this city's infrastructure and that it should be easier to get around. There should be more uh, main circuits to get you from A to B. And especially like you look at the New York subway system versus our subway system, we've got two lines that go north and south. And right now, really only one line that goes east and west. In New York, you can go anywhere you want to go on the subway, right? In, in Barcelona, you can go anywhere you want to go on the subway. Um, and Toronto just fell behind in that aspect. And I think it really affects us. And, and I think you'd see our market being even bigger if we had more main points of uh, public transit. Because that's what's also driving prices. The number one thing right now, because less and less people are driving because of that traffic that you mentioned, and just because of affordability, it's one less bill to pay, right? When your rent's so high or your mortgage payments are so high, if you don't have to pay 400 bucks a month for your car, why not, right? Mm -hmm. Save that money and use it towards your mortgage. And you want to live near transit. And that's driving prices up right around those subway stations. It's crazy. It's absolutely insane. So now we kind of really kind of gave the audience a really good understanding of what Toronto's like, what the market's there and how insane it is. Let's talk about you. Tell everybody like what you're doing today and then let's take a trip back in your short history and talk a little bit about what it was like, you know, when you kind of, you know, when you were younger and in what this journey to success has looked like. So like yeah. give everybody with a, what's your business today? What are you doing? I mean, uh, I've always kind of been doing a whole bunch of stuff at the same time, not knowing where I'm headed and going a million directions at once, going 150 miles an hour. That's kind of always been my personality. Finally here, as I reach 25, the grizzly old age, I've found a niche in real estate, in dealing with people, in dealing with families and, you know, helping them find, whether it's their first home, an investment project, whether it's selling a condo, selling a house, and like I said, I found a niche and it's worked and uh, I'm continuing to push and push and push and I'm extremely competitive. And, uh, you know, I see a lot of real estate agents out there doing well, or at least 
looking like they're doing well, posting a bunch of Instagrams and wearing a bunch of watches that we don't know are real or fake. And, and uh, I want to beat those people. And, uh, but nicely, I want to beat them in a nice way because I'm a nice Canadian boy. Um, but, uh, you know, that's my life now. It's selling and buying houses and living in this crazy real estate world of Toronto. Um, but it's been a, it's been a long journey to get here and I've dipped my spoon in a bunch of different pies over the, over the course of the last 25 years. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'd love to tell you about that as well. Well, yeah, we're going to like, so I remember before we got this started, we were talking just a little bit about how many deals you've done and, you know, your goals that you've set for yourself from 2019 to 2020. Just give everybody just a picture of like, you know, what that looks like, you know, what your business today looks right. like. You know, you, you talk any way you want, how many deals you've done, how much money you've made and like how you set these goals and how you're just exploding yep. out of these well, goals. I, I want to try and remain as humble as possible. I think that is important. Um, however, you know, I basically hit the ground running in 2019, got my real estate license and did my first deal on the 5th of January. Um, 2019, I did just over 40 deals. Uh, however, high volume, low purchase price, um, which gained me a shit ton of experience. I mean, you do 40 deals in a year and you make mistakes on every single deal. And it just made me so much more prepared for 2020. Because uh, I, I tell you, deals bit me in the ass that I did in January, they bit me in the ass in September because I didn't know what I was doing. I was operating on my own. I was, you know, and it's crazy to think that a 24 year old operating on his own can orchestrate buying or selling the biggest purchase of somebody's life. Right. And, and that also keeps me up at night because I have to make sure that my work is mistake free. Right. Uh, Cause there's a lot of liability there. And it's also just on my conscience, conscience. Um, so that kind of led me into 2020 where I've already surpassed my 2019 in terms of dollars and cents. And uh, I, I mean, I don't know what to do with all this money. I, I've invested some, I bought my first investment property um, and I'm trying to play the game smart, but I also try to enjoy my life as a 25 year old. I mean, I don't think I have to run around town looking for an apartment building to buy and looking to build my future just yet in my RRSP or my retirement savings plan. That'd be the um, last place. I, that'd be the last place I'd tell you to put the money. Yeah, exactly. And you know, a few trips, a few vacations, some nice dinners, taking my friends out uh, because you know I think that when you are in a fortunate place, which won't last. I mean, it never lasts forever. Take advantage of it, and uh, you know, sharing is caring. And uh, so, but we're in a good place right now. I'm crazy busy. I mean, today has been a whirlwind. This week has been a whirlwind. And, uh, you know, but, you know, take it day by day and deal by deal. And hopefully the rest of the year, double what I've already done now. And, you know, on my way to hopefully being a seven figure agent mm -hmm. in this market. That's fantastic. Well, let, let's take a trip back in time. Tell them like where you began, what kind of made you this person today? So all five foot eight of me uh, always dreamed of being a professional athlete. I mean, my competitive streak, uh, I played quarterback here in Toronto, playing football, which I know it's hard to believe being five foot eight, but I did it and I did it pretty well. And, uh, you know, that was really the only thing I had. It was my ability to run and throw the football and everything else. You know, I could jib jab a little bit like we're doing right now. But other than that, couldn't play the piano, couldn't play the guitar, uh, not musically inclined as well at all. Not good at math, not good at English, um, never a school guy. Uh, and that led me to going on a partial scholarship to the States to play football out at the University of Puget Sound where uh, unfortunately I broke my collarbone, uh, never played a down of football over there, uh, had surgery, came back home, dropped out of school, basically gave up on football, um, still wanted to pursue sports, got into sports media. I actually, crazy story is I worked at the Toronto Sports Network, TSN, and I applied to the local school over here, Ryerson Sports Media Program, while I was working at TSN. Most people would go to the program in order to get the job at TSN. 
I had the job at TSN. I applied to the program. Didn't get in. Two years. Did not get in. I, I tell you, I wrote, a, I wrote a letter to every single member on that board and the dean saying, you know, just like, you know, Tom Brady said, if you don't pick me, it'd be the worst decision you ever made. And uh, that wasn't because I knew I was going to be a sports media mogul. It's it just because I knew I was going to be something. And they were going to say, damn, I wish that I had Brett Stein as my alumni. And I mean, I think that drove me for a lot of my life is every single person that said no to me. I just said, no matter what I become, you're going to be like, damn, I had the opportunity to shake that guy's hand, Brett Stein, you know, or they're going to tell their kids that, oh, I turned down Brett Stein, just like the basketball coach who cut Michael Jordan. Right. And uh, that was always my, my mentality. So I dropped out of university, never got my degree, was told by everybody that I was never going to get a job um, and that you need your degree. And you, even your degree is not enough. You got to go get your master's. Um, you got to go to law school. And I just never believed that. I believe that if I worked hard enough and that if I stayed driven and if I got out of bed in the morning, right, because that's half the battle, that. I was going to make something of myself. And I mean, I'm not there yet, but it is nice to look around and say, you know, people are looking at me and saying, wow, Brett, you're doing so well. What are you doing? Tell me what, tell me what you're doing. Tell me what tricks you're using. And I'm think, thinking to myself, you know, it feels nice to be looked at as not a college dropout, right? As not a failed athlete. Um, give you one more quick story. Uh, I was selling charity on the streets of Toronto. So I, I don't know how often you're in Toronto, but sometimes you see these people in some funky outfits and they're going, save the children, save the children, save the children, right? And I mean, as much as we all want to help the children, these are the most annoying people in the city. And you don't want to talk to them for one second. And I was that guy. I was trying to sell charity for kids in Africa. I was trying to save the animals, uh, you know, all these things, but it was sales. And I was learning every single day because I think for every yes you get, you got a thousand no's out there on the street, a thousand. And it's not only no's, it's part of my language, but it's fuck you, get out of my face, right? And you learn to accept that rejection and you see it every day and it just becomes normalized. Now when someone tells me to go fuck myself, rolls off me like water. And, and the equivalent to that in my business now is somebody that I'm working with maybe cheating on me and going to buy another house with another agent or not using me to sell their house doesn't affect me anymore. And uh, I think I learned that from that experience of being out there on the street. And at the time, all my friends, all my family, what are you doing? What are you doing? What is this going to get you? Where, where is this going to get you? What progress are you making? And everyone's obsessed with that. What progress are you making in everything you're doing? Why aren't you moving forward? But I think that as long as you're doing something, you're learning from every experience. And that is moving you forward. I mean, I'm learning right now from, from this experience. And hopefully the next time I go on here, I won't be, you know, uh, and I'll be able to speak a little bit more clearly without stuttering. Um, you're good. But yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's been a lot of humbling moments in my life and I'm sure there'll be a ton more. I mean, the market, it's going to come down. Uh, I mean, people are going to stop buying like crazy eventually and I'm going to have to pick up and find something else to go and do and hopefully do it to the best of my ability. So during this whole journey, I just wanted to see if I can show you something here. One of the things that's been happening here in the States, and, and this is not really representation is, you know, I've been telling people to get out of the stock market for a while just because it's at the high point, you know, and I'm always leery on any market where, when it's in a high point. And, you know, I don't know if you can see that, but the markets today, you know, had another down day and it's just been like yeah. one day after another because of this coronavirus, the markets are going down and down and down. And, you know, I don't, I know in 08 and 09, when we had our fallout, you guys didn't get hit hard, but maybe this next thing that's going to come, and I'm not saying that this is it, but maybe it is, this could be that thing that stops it. But you're right. 
You never know when that's going to happen, so you can't worry about it. You just got to push ahead, go out there, and do what you do. And like you said, every single no is one step closer to a yes, and you got hardened on the streets selling charity, and everybody's got their story. That's, you know, that's kind of what made you thick-skinned, and that's probably one of the reasons you're, you're having success is if something bad happens, you're just like, okay, on to the next, and that's just the way you need to do it. During this whole journey, what would you say one of the biggest external obstacles – uh, that you had is like, what would be your biggest external obstacle during this whole thing? Well, it, it's ongoing and it's just feeding off of what I said before is one factor is not finishing school. The other factor is my age. And I mean, age is a huge thing. How many people ask me every day? How old are you? How old are you? How long have you been doing this? How long have you been doing this? And I mean, I say, does it matter? I mean, does it matter how old I am? I say, I swear to God, I, I say, I can't tell you. They, they ask me all that. I say, I can't tell you. I say, how old do you think I am? 30. I say, okay, that's good enough. Works for me. And we move on because it's not important. But it is a huge obstacle because if a baby boomer is trying to sell his $3.5 million home in Forest Hill over here in Toronto, is he going to want to work with a 25-year-old realtor who's been doing this for two years? No, he's not. So you have to always battle to show added value. Um, and I mean, at this point, it's 100% worth it to try and turn your youth into a positive rather than into a negative. Because this market, not only this market, but every single market out there in the world is built for the youth right now, right? Like you just look, people are making millions of dollars dancing around on TikTok. You know what oh, I mean? Crazy. Like 16 year old girls. Are, are making millions of dollars, you know, showing their bellies and dancing. And, uh, you know, if, if that doesn't show you that the youth is taking over, then I don't know what does. Um, but that's, it's a huge obstacle. And I get it every single day. How old are you? And people come to me, young people in my office, they come to me and they say, how do you get over that obstacle? Because I don't believe I'm 25. I got, in my heart, I'm 30, 35 years old. No problem. I've been doing this for 20 years. I've been selling real estate for 20 years and I believe it with every bone in my body. Um, but you know, I'm not an expert in everything. And that's why I trust the people that are, you know, I don't know what to do with my money. You're talking about the stock market. I got no idea about the stock market. Stay out of it. And I think it would be, I would be, I think it would be a huge mistake for me to be like, Oh, look, I've got some extra money lying around. Here's some penny stocks that I think might times 50. But that's so many people, people do get, that. I mean, because they, they think that's, that's what they've been taught their whole lives. And it's just, yeah. it's the biggest trap that there is. And I hear it every day yeah. and I've been trying to teach it. This podcast is largely due to money and that's my specialty is money. And, you know, it's yeah. kind of just like, you'll figure it out, you know, but there's so many things and I'm, I'd, I'd be happy to help you give you some pointers in the right direction. Yeah. But, you know, the first it's thing the when you mentioned reason, RSPs, stay out of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the same reason why, you know, you, you see people go to the casino people you know go to vegas right because you hear about everybody coming back who wins oh i went to the casino i made 10 grand right but you didn't hear about the last 20 times right they exactly. went and they lost 20 exactly. right and so you're seeing oh my god bitcoin millionaire this millionaire look how many people are making money on marijuana and you know it's it's what one percent less those are the people that are making money and for the yeah. rest it's, for the rest of us it's just throwing away money and putting it into rich people's pockets. Mm -hmm. Might as well hang on to it. I mean, God's not making any more real estate. So you might as well get involved. That's one thing that can't go away. Right. There's a plot of land. You got to live. Right. So that's not crashing. That's not going off the market, which is why you're, I mean, you're so much better at getting involved in the real estate market than you are in terms of the stock market. Cause you, your stock can go off the board and you have no control on that whatsoever. And it also has nothing to do with how that company is actually doing, right? It's public perception and I can't get involved in that. It would drive me nuts. It mm -hmm. would drive me absolutely nuts. So that's your external. And in closing, like one last question, what would be your biggest internal obstacle that you've faced? Um, well, I think it's kind of trying to be genuine here is what direction I want my life to go in. Mm -hmm. I mean, you right now I'm a single guy living in Toronto making decent money. I mean, do I want to try and push and push and push and be, you know, that guy who walks into the room and everyone says, Oh, that's Brett Stein, but he's single 
and doesn't have a family and, you know, maybe four times divorced, who knows? Or do I want to be a family guy and put my energy into that? Because I think it's so hard to do both. I mean, just from what I see, I don't know about, you know, what you see out there, but I see so many guys who are working late hours, guys and girls working late hours, putting 95% of their time and effort into their work and into making money. And um, the other 5% is just not enough for the rest of the things in life, like your friends and your family and uh, doing things that actually make you happy. I mean, that's something that I battle with every single day. And like on a day like today where I've been running around in no time to do anything, I mean, I wish I could have, you know, it's Friday night, fuck, you know, I should be, I should be getting ready, you know, putting on a nice, nice pair of shoes and going to have some drinks with the boys, but I got fucking work to do. Yeah. And I yeah. can't. I know a thing or two about and, that. Yeah. And yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's, that's honestly, that's a really good way to answer that question because honestly you kind of dug deep on that one and you know, like that is something you need to think about. And that is definitely an internal obstacle that, you know, you will have to face because I've seen it happen many times. I mean, I see a lot of successful young people that just blow their money. And my, one of my good friends who does a lot of my events with me, Justin, in his early twenties, he, he was a big wholesaler made seven, eight hundred million dollars and he would just go out and party and spend it and blow it and he's, he had nothing to show and he tells this story a lot and how he had nothing but memories and all the people he thought were his friends because he was paying from the travel here or do this or the champagne. When that all dried up in 2008, those people were gone, man. They were gone. They weren't yeah, his yeah. friends and he was left to really do some soul searching to figure out like, who am I? What am I really trying to do and what's, you know, what do I have to do next? And then he had to climb himself out and he's back, back on top, but different now, you know, very different is his focus is different. Yeah. It's a giving focus. It's more about helping others build and, and be something that he can help them do that. And it, it, there's just so much to it. So I admire you for coming up with that, but in closing, uh, if people want to find you or, or check you out, how do they do that? Hopefully not TikTok. So no, not TikTok. Well, I mean, I tried it for a little while, but I'm not a good dancer and I'm not a 16 year old girl. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to give my Twitter away. That's private. B Stein 09. That is, sorry, Brett Stein 09. That is my Instagram handle. Brett Stein on LinkedIn because you got to plug it. And, um, you know, that's where you find me. I, it's where you find me talking a bunch of nonsense, running around homes and, you know, uh, checking out these places with clients, beautiful places, ship boxes, whatever they are. Uh, Toronto, you, you find everything over here. And, uh, but not just real estate, a little bit of everything. You, you get some uh, insight into my private life and, uh, you know, me with my buddies and maybe with a few too many drinks down the chute, um, which is always a good time. Uh, yeah, Brett Stein 09. That's my Instagram. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you being on the show today and I'm sure some people picked up some good golden nuggets and, you know, some things that'll kind of motivate them. Cause you know, we've never had a realtor on here. I've always, you know, kind of shunned away from that cause this is more investors, but you know what? A lot of the investors are becoming realtors and it's important that they see somebody young that's being successful in one of the most difficult markets out there. Uh, your market's incredibly competitive and you know, that's, there's something to be said for that, putting your head down, working hard and, and just uh, taking it how it is and making it happen letting what did you say it just bounces off you like the the nose and yeah, yeah just rolls off me like water and deal by deal day by day and all you can do is wake up in the morning and hopefully put one foot in front of the other and uh you know that that's the main thing like i said it's that's half the battle getting up in the morning and saying you're gonna attack the day and you're gonna go after it rather than letting it come to you i mean if you live life like that, then you never know what opportunities you're going to come across. And I don't know what I'm going to be doing in 10 years. I think if I keep living the way I'm living where, you know, that's basically being an absolute yes man saying yes to every single opportunity that comes across, you know, I could be sailing the Bermuda, you know, in, uh, in 10 years. Venture Why the Catholic. Bermuda when you got Lake Ontario right there? Uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever been in Lake Ontario, I'm but you know, joking, don't drink totally joking. <laughs> Well, all right, man. Well, I appreciate you being on the show. And for all of you, you that are watching this episode, you know, he, he said it, go after it. Just 
unrelentlessly go after what you're trying to do and, you know, spend some time self, you know, inside thinking and searching as to what you're really doing and what you're really building. And that's some great takeaways. So go out there, take action and get started on becoming a rebel banker. Thank you all for joining me for another episode of the Real Estate Money School. We'll see you on the next episode.